Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Reeder, and I'm helping lead us through our study of the book of Exodus. Uh, this is week number six, and uh, we're going to cover a whole lot, so we may skip over some, some, some sections depending on time. Um, but uh, essentially, we're going to be covering kind of um, middle of chapter seven, so chapter seven, verse eight, all the way through the end of chapter 10. So you got a, a pretty solid lengthy section and uh, before we jump in um, if you're able I'd encourage you to pause it and if you haven't yet uh, maybe read that whole section through so read all the way until chapter 11 that'll give us um, a good amount of ground to cover um, and just think as you read it what what things do you hear repeated um, we're going to be covering kind of the section on uh, plagues one through nine and um, as you read them, look for repetition, look for what things seem to stand out. And um, yeah, just if you have a couple minutes, take it and read it and we'll pick up in just a minute. Thanks. All right, let's jump into our sixth week of discussion on uh, Exodus. And I'm going to start reading in chapter seven, verse one, since that'll give us a little bit of review from last week, right? So Moses has... Um, has essentially been talking with the Lord. Um, things have not gone well for Moses. It's been a pretty rough journey with every kind of discussion with uh, Pharaoh. Things seem to get worse. Um, not only does Pharaoh not listen, but his own people have begun to turn against him. They are frustrated with Moses for even uh, kind of just telling them that they should be free and then telling Pharaoh that he should let them free. So things are things are pretty rough. And so God has kind of come alongside in chapter 7 and beginning of chapter seven and kind of given another charge and kind of said, Hey, I am with you. This is what I'm calling you to do. Go and do it. Um, now you're going to start to see some stuff. So in chapter seven, verse one, which we covered last week, we'll, I'll start reading again. The Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the lands of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. So he's prepping Moses. Hey, guess what? Though you do all this stuff, it's not exactly going to go the way it should go. Pharaoh is not going to roll over. Um, I'm actually going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Hmm, interesting point of discussion, right? And then as his heart gets hardened, I will lay out heavier and heavier and heavier, as it were, consequences if you're going to resist me then i'm going to push back and that that push that shove that uh uh give and take between these two beings of power god on one hand and pharaoh on the other is going to become more and more significant so understand kind of what god's thinking and going in, in, in into this is it's going to have to get to the place where my power is seen um, not just a, a pinky of my power, but my full arm is going to come to bear. And we're going to see how it, how it goes. Verse 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. So that was from last week. Now we're going to jump into kind of the beginning of the actual confrontation. This is when God is beginning to exercise power. And it starts out small, but it continues to grow. So in verse 8, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Um, so things to think about here. Um, obviously, this is, a, this is a, a sign that Aaron has done before. Um, Moses has actually done it also when he was with God, and then Aaron does it for the people. And now God's saying, hey, go do the same sign for Pharaoh. And the reason why this sign is somewhat significant is that Pharaoh wore a headdress of a cobra, um, we, we, we have a lot of archaeological evidence to that extent to show that he actually wore this. It's almost like a, a cobra's hood. And that, in many ways, was the symbol of his divinity. It was a symbol that he was above everybody else. I am by divine right a God. And you, 
need to listen to me as I exercise my power as a god. I am a son of the gods, and I myself am a god on earth. And uh, so anyway, within that context, this is somewhat significant. Uh, Aaron is saying, actually, actually, our god, or Moses is saying, our god actually has the power of uh, serpents. This serpent power that kind of you you claim, uh, that's actually not yours. That that may, may be a borrowed deal. So anyway, so Aaron casts down the serpent, or the, the staff. It becomes a serpent. Verse 11. Pharaoh then summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. So get, get the idea. Oh, you can do that? Guess what? I've got a whole army of guys who can do the exact same thing. You're nothing special. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. So you can kind of imagine these staffs are kind of the representation of their power. Like these are uh, kind of big deal guys and they walk in. Yeah, we can do the same thing you you can. But then it's clear, a little bit of a nudge. Uh, Aaron's staff's going to swallow up all your staffs. It's a little bit of a power move saying, uh, you think you have the power. Okay, guess what? Maybe you do have a little bit of power here. Let's go head to head and see what happens. Aaron's staff wins. And notice the summary, verse 13. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. So, first contest is over. Uh, Yahweh is the clear winner, but there's pushback from Pharaoh. Now, we're, we're going to go pretty fast through some of this, just because I don't want to run out of, out of time. So, hold on tight. Starting in verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the, the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning, as he is going out to the water. So, you're going to notice in plague. Uh, I think it's, uh, let's see, this is one. I want to say it's, uh, there's certain ones that will always have kind of that same note. They're going to go out to meet Pharaoh in the morning. He's kind of going out. You can imagine kind of peaceful, maybe doing a ritual bath. We're not sure, but that's specifically where Moses is told to meet him. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he's going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. So the idea is Pharaoh goes out in the morning, uh, some sort of ritual probably on the Nile. The Nile is the central power, the most valuable thing in all of Egypt. It's what gives uh, Egypt its fertility. It's where commerce moves. Everything in life, including the water, comes from the Nile. And so Pharaoh heads out to the Nile. And who should confront him there? Oh, the prophet of Yahweh. And what does he say? You have chosen not to obey me. So understand what's going on. There is a competition going on between powers, between the self-proclaimed God, Pharaoh, and the self-proclaimed God, Yahweh. And Yahweh is saying, you should obey me. But thus so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, the canals, the ponds, all their pools of water, so that they may become blood, and there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile. And all the water in the Nile turned to blood. And the fish in the Nile died. And the Nile stank so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There is blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house. And he did not even take this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink for they could not drink the water of the Nile. So the idea is, in this opening plague, as it were, Egypt's greatest resource, their power, kind of the heart of their wealth, uh, everything that they value, summed up in the Nile, is challenged, right? It is turned to blood. Suddenly, this land that revolves around this one main water source is kind of put to a stand standstill. We don't we're not really sure what the significance of the blood is, but the idea is this thing that gives life is now bringing forth death. 
And what are you gonna gonna do? Nothing. And it's interesting. The magicians step forward and they're able to change water to blood. But what they, interesting enough, can't do is stop the the process. And once again, this isn't this is hard hitting, but everybody can still dig along the Nile and kind of sur- survive. So it's funny. Pharaoh turns and goes into his own house, and he does not take it to heart. Meaning, ah, whatever. Okay. 25. Seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. So that's the end of plague one. Plague two. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the house of your servants and your people, into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come upon you and on your people and on all your servants. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, over the pools, and make the frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So once again, um, the Nile is source of water. Frogs are pretty common along the Nile. What's amazing here is Yahweh is demonstrating, once again, he has power over this Egyptian land. He has power not just over the water, but over the animals, over the life that surrounds the water. And now this life that's kind of been a normal part of life is suddenly taking over um, in a not helpful way. It's almost like God is saying, oh yeah, this, this normal creation that you've experienced, I'm turning it on its head. And now these animals are going to go everywhere. Um, Notice the magicians do the same. We're not sure really what that means, but apparently they make frogs come up out of who knows where, and they begin to cover the land of Egypt. Verse 8, Pharaoh then called to Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and your servants and for your people, that the frogs may be cut off from you and your servants and be left only in the Nile. And he said, Tomorrow. Moses said, Be it as you say, so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses here is, once again, uh, he's confronted Pharaoh. And for the first time, Pharaoh kind of says, okay, okay, I can see you got a little bit of power here. Okay, you know what? Why don't you take those frogs away? Let's, uh, okay, maybe you win this, this round. I'm asking you, you go plead with the Lord, which is interesting. That casts Moses in light of uh, definitely a prophet, but... In some ways, um, Moses becomes the archetypal prophet that everybody else will follow. Not only in his relationship with kings of foreign countries, but with all of Israel's kings. All of Israel's kings are subject to a prophet, someone who speaks for God. So this authority figure who is and ought to act in a way that's wise for the benefit of the people, regardless of what he thinks, he is always subject to someone who speaks for God, and that person is called a prophet. Here... Um, in the same way, Pharaoh recognizes that and said, okay, you go pray to your God, get rid of these, these frogs. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, courtyards, and fields, and they gathered them in heaps and the land stank. So you can imagine, uh, it's bringing out some amazing, uh, both imagery as well as aroma. Uh, imagine all these dead animals everywhere. Um, And not only do we see God's power to bring about these plagues, but also here we see him bring them to an end as a result of Pharaoh's pleading to Moses and then Moses praying. Verse 15, and when Pharaoh saw there was a rest, but he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Verse 16, then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and on beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. So some of the significance here is uh, we've moved from the Nile and then water and then life from these, 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 these frogs, and now we've moved kind of from water to earth. So Egypt, sandy place, dust, and the idea is this dust becomes some sort of, the, the, the word here is gnats. We're really not sure what that means. That can mean potentially lice or fleas. And the idea is it's a small 
irritating bug that just like there's dust throughout all the land of Egypt, that dust comes alive and begins to uh, drive people absolutely nuts, right? All the, the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. So the land itself, it's not just limited to the Nile and the creatures in the Nile, but the land itself is beginning to turn against the Egyptians. Verse 18, the magi magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. This is just kind of a hilarious comment. Well, these magicians have been keeping up so far, but uh, now we're kind of, they're a little bit above their, their pay grade now. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And you kind of get the idea that these, these guys kind of have felt like, you know what? We can keep up with this Moses, with this Aaron guy. Yeah, you know, we're, we're, par, we're on par. Um, we're kind of had the same skills. And the point here is these magicians come to Pharaoh and say, uh, dude, uh, we're out of our league. And this isn't about these guys. This is not about Aaron and Moses. So the idea is the magicians themselves are acknowledging there's something in play here beyond some cool tricks and beyond two really powerful guys. The finger of God. Um, it doesn't say Yahweh. So the idea is, though, that um, the divine beings who are above and around you, Pharaoh, they are in play here. This isn't just a small deal. You are dealing with God's own finger. It's interesting. Hold on to the idea of the finger. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So even when the magicians begin to push back, Pharaoh doesn't take it to heart. Verse 20, then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning. So there's the morning theme again. This is the, uh, the fourth. And present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out of the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there. That you may know that I am the Lord. I am Yahweh in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall happen. So notice a couple things. Notice... Um, there's a time frame given. This is going to happen tomorrow. We've seen that a couple times, right? We've also seen um, Moses go out and meet him in the morning as he's approaching the Nile. Um, and uh, what else is interesting here? Notice the division. So these aren't just little biting gnats or flea. These are just flies everywhere. So we're not sure what the gnats are, but in my mind, I think they're, they're, they're very distinct from these flies. So once again, we've gone from water with the first two, two plagues, to land with the third, to now the air, uh, things that are flying up above the land are beginning to turn against the Egyptians. It's like all of creation is slowly being empowered to turn against these Egyptians. And notice this also, I'll put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow the sign shall happen. So what is God trying to do? God's trying to show my power is over all the earth, if something doesn't happen in a certain region, it's because I say so. My power is not limited to, you know, whatever land these Israelites are going to or wherever they came from. I am God over all the earth. I am not just one deity among many. I am that deity. I am the king of all kings. And I'm going to create a division between my people and your people. I am that powerful. And these people are to be distinct. Verse 24, and the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by swarms of flies. So for the first time, this idea of these flies are making things disgusting so that food and everything is, and the word here is ruined, destroyed. The same word is going to refer to the destroying angel that's going to show up later. But the idea is that the land of Egypt not only is just devolving into chaos but creation itself is not just coming unhinged but is turning against Egypt so that it's destroyed verse 25 then Pharaoh called to Moses and Aaron and said go sacrifice to your God so you're beginning to see okay Pharaoh's like okay okay gotcha okay yeah why don't you go do this go sacrifice to the Lord your God but notice the caveat 
within the land. But Moses said, It would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh, I think, is kind of trying to pull a fast one and say, oh, okay, if you really want to go sacrifice, go go, go do it. And um, it's kind of funny. Moses, in a way, is kind of picking up on this idea that, oh, you want us to, you, you kind of want us to compromise on our worship? Well, how would that go for your guys if we did that? Like, does that mean your people were willing to compromise? If, if, if we do this here, they're going to want to kill us. This is an abomination to them. So you want us to not take as it were, our religion seriously, when we all know you were gonna, you're going to take your religion seriously, is that really what you want to do to your people? It's, I'm, I'm unsure as how serious Moses is with his response or whether it's kind of like just poking his finger in Pharaoh's eye and saying, okay, come on, dude. Come on, be, be realistic. Um, so uh, Pharaoh continues, I will let you go sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. So Pharaoh kind of says, okay, you can go, but plead for me, just don't go too far. Right? Then Moses said, behold, I'm going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Notice the time frame. This is where it gets rich. I love this. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses here is, he's beginning to, as it were, show some backbone in the sense that, hey, Pharaoh, I'm calling you out. You said this before, and then you didn't follow through. Be careful what you say, dude. Don't, don't, as it were, cheat again. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. Not one remained. Verse 32, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. So you hear the refrain of Pharaoh hardening his heart. Pharaoh has the opportunity to listen and obey and he makes the decision to say, no, I'm doubling down. I am... I am growing more and more resistant to this people being let go, right? Okay, so we're going to now jump to plague number five. Then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague on your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing. And the next day the Lord did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of all the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent. And behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. So notice... uh, the death. Notice these animals. Notice, once again, these animals that are supposed to be used by people, they're supposed to be under people. Pharaoh can't even care for his own animals. When Yahweh says so, a plague hits them and they all die. And notice that the timing, the whole tomorrow thing. This is going to happen on my time, Yahweh says. Um, and lastly, the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Um, you got to keep hearing this theme. It's, it's, it's a very repetitive thing that's trying to drive home a, a point. These two beings who are extremely powerful are going up against one another. And the pounding doesn't serve as it were to, as it seems, to weaken one. But the one who should give up gets more and more resolve to fight back. Right? Okay. Um, nine verse eight. Let's see. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses threw it into the air and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. 
But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. So remember the kilns. Kilns are used for baking bricks. So some of the irony here is that the very uh, the brick baking works of the Egyptians, which the Israelites were being forced to use to build bricks for the Egyptians, that very dust is now turned against Pharaoh and his people. Um, we have no idea what, what sort of sickness this this is, but the idea is the boils are something probably external. So there's there's physical effects of this that are very obvious. So much so that even the the magicians who have kind of admitted defeat now suddenly they're just like, now nah, we're out of here. We we can't even stand in the presence of Moses. He he scares us. And we feel unworthy, so we are out. Um, and verse 12, very interesting. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to us. So notice there's a shift here. Um, Pharaoh's been hardening himself, and now it seems like Yahweh is taking part in us. And okay, guess what? Even this, I'm not going to let this soften you. I'm going to let this harden you. Verse 13, Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning, present yourself before Pharaoh, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For this time, I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now, I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have, you would have been cut off from the earth. Get this line, it's critical. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as never been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send, get your livestock and all that you have into the field, in, into safe shelter for every man and beast that's in the field and is not brought into the home will die when the hail falls on them. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. Um, so once again, he goes out in the morning, let my people go. Um, but here there's a subtle shift. This is the seventh plague. And the idea is you still don't get who I am. You still have no respect for what I'm doing. But I want you to know, I'm actually raising you up for this very, very purpose that I want you to know. But notice the bigger picture. I want the whole earth to know that I am not like all the other gods. I am Yahweh. I am the God of creation. I am the all-powerful God. I am the God above all those other gods. I am to be respected. Um, so it's kind of funny. We, we were reading to our kids the other night in 1 Samuel, and there's this moment which the Philistines recognize who the Lord is and they say Philistines be careful because this is the same God who wiped out Egypt and now that that probably this probably happened hundreds of years before this occurrence with the Philistines much later but the idea is this this is not a confrontation whose ramifications are just limited to either Israel or Egypt but as we find out in multiple passages later shockwaves from Egypt's destruction, go out, and everybody hears about it, and everybody knows, oh yeah, that's that Israelite God, Yahweh. Yeah, be careful. Don't mess with him. So, um, I think it's also funny in verse 20, um, whoever feared the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh. So, the idea is that the Egyptians themselves are starting to get respect for this Yahweh God. They're starting to take him seriously. They're starting to listen to his servant Moses. Um Verse 22, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the heavens, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran down on the earth. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the, of the hail. Very heavy hail, very heavy hail, such had never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field, in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people were, was there no hail. So the idea is it is these ginormous storms that explode. Um, there's the Egyptian gods who ride in the storm, who control storms. And the idea is actually that's not your Egyptian gods that control that. That's our God, Yahweh. Um, the idea of fire 
That's just lightning. It's the idea there's these ginormous hailstorms, lightning, thunder. Um, once again, Yahweh is in control of everything. There's nothing outside his control, and he's just kind of ramping up, uh, ramping up the destruction. Verse 27, Then Pharaoh called and sent and sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. And you kind of get for a moment hope like, Whoa, finally we're breaking through. He's owning his sin. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. So there's almost a legal judgment that Pharaoh's saying, Whoa, okay, got it. He's the, the, the judge. I am found guilty. I admit my guilt. Um, I proclaim Yahweh to be in the right. I and my people, which is funny, he includes his people, are in the wrong. Verse 28, Moses plead with the Lord, for there has been enough of God's hail and thunder. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. So you think, oh man, huge breakthrough moment, right? Fair is finally getting this. They aren't two equals doing battle, but this is Yahweh. This is Pharaoh. Moses said to him, as soon as I've gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. The idea is all creation, cosmos, um, heaven, earth, everything in between is under the power of of Yahweh. Verse 30, but as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. So it's kind of funny. Last chapter we saw those who fear the Lord, and the idea is Moses is pushing back and saying, yeah, you guys still don't really get this. This, he kind of calls his bluff and says, actually, I, I know that you still do this. This is, we're going to ramp this up further. Verse 31, the flax and the barley were struck down, for the barley was in ear and the flax was in bud, but the wheat and the emmer were not struck down, for they are late in coming up. So you're actually given a time frame of when destruction rains down, which crops were killed. You could almost figure out what type, what type of year it, it is. Very interesting comment. Verse 33, so Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and stretched out his hands to the Lord, and the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured upon the earth. Verse 34, but when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again. So notice the idea of sin com coming up. Rebellion. He sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So there is a, a guilt. Um, God hardens. Now Pharaoh is growing more and more frustrated. No, I am standing up against this. Is not, this is not okay. And he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Chapter 10, verse 1. Let me grab my notes here. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. So notice ver chap chapter 9, the heart of Pharaoh is hardened. Um, he hardened his heart. So 34, he hardens his heart. 35, his heart's hardened. 10, verse 1. I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. So notice all three of those things. It's just happening. Pharaoh is doing it himself and God's doing himself. Those things actually go together. There's, there is a tension there, but there's not a huge distinction. Those things all work together. I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants that I may show these signs of mine among them and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I've done among them that you may know that I am the Lord. So notice God's concern is not just that Moses and the people around him know, but that this becomes a bedrock event that shapes the future for Moses' descendants, for the descendants of the children of Israel. They're supposed to hold on to this. It is supposed to be formative for how they see themselves and how they see Yahweh. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? So God begins to put his finger on it. You think you are still on par with me. How long do we have to go play this game until you back down? Let my people go that they may serve me. So the contrast is they've been serving you. You are not a worthy king. I am far above you. I am worthy of their service. Let them go that they may serve me. Totally different service. The people will be happy under my leadership. You need to back down. Humble yourself. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I'll bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail, and they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field, and they shall fill your houses, the houses of your servants, and all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. So the idea is, 
unprecedented plague of locusts. It's kind of funny. In recent days, in uh, Africa, they've seen these huge locust pla uh, plagues actually occur. And you should see, you should check out some of the video from it. It's not hard to find on, on Google, but clouds of small, I want to say small, locusts will swarm so that they literally blot out the light. They look like a cloud. They'll darken the, the sky um, and they will eat everything. And this is happening here. And notice this, they've never seen anything like this. This is unprecedented in this size. So Moses leaves Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servant said, said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. So Pharaoh's own people now are turning against him, almost like the Israelites did to Moses. Now the Egyptians are doing the same thing to Pharaoh. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? The idea here is, Egypt as a land is already destroyed. Now he's threatening this and you're not backing down? What are you thinking? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh kind of takes a step back. He's like, okay, call him back. And he said to them, go serve the Lord your, your God. But which ones are to go? Moses said, we'll go with our young and our old. Meaning we're taking everybody, dude. This isn't just about a couple men going. We will go with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to them, The Lord be with you if I ever let you and your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. So Pharaoh is picking up on the idea that, hey, maybe this jaunt into the wilderness is actually uh, is more than just a couple people going out to worship for a while. The idea, the really, the big idea here is who is served here? Who ultimately has to say, is it Yahweh who says, yeah, my people let, let them go to worship me? Or is it Pharaoh ultimately who's going to control that worship um no go the men among you and serve the lord for that is what you are asking and they were driven out from pharaoh's presence so moses and aaron get driven out now verse 12 then the lord said to moses stretch out your hand over the land of egypt for the locusts so that they may come upon the land of egypt and eat every plant in the land all that the hail is left so moses stretched out his staff over the land of egypt and the lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night we're going to see the east wind come again in a couple weeks. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been before, nor ever will be again. They covered the whole face of the land, so the land was darkened. And they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field, throughout all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses there and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please... Forgive my sin only this once and plead with the Lord your God to remove this death from me. So we kind of think swarm of bugs, no big deal. They are seeing the future and knowing that now everything's gone. The food for the, for the future is gone. Death is coming. This is a precursor to can it get much worse than this, right? We're facing potential famine. And the Lord turned I see. So he went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord. And the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go. Verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. This isn't just... You know, it's kind of dim. This idea is it's a darkness you can feel. We're not really sure what that means, but it's it's somewhat significant. And it's kind of hearkening back to the beginning of creation. Basically, at this point, all of creation has turned against the land of Egypt. Um, it's as though creation itself over Egypt is beginning to come undone. And where do things start? They start out in darkness. And where are they returning under Yahweh's power? To darkness. Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch blackness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. Then Pharaoh called Moses and said, Go serve the Lord. Your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. 
But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock must also go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take of them to serve the Lord our God. And we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. So the other kind of aspect of this, there's a couple things that are just kind of critical to see. So the Egyptian god Ra, kind of the, the god of gods in Egypt, is Ra, the god of the sun. And who is Ra, the god of the sun's son? Who is his, as it were, physical representative on earth? It is Pharaoh. So this last plague is kind of the um, striking at the heart of Pharaoh's power. Oh yeah, you're the, the, the son of the sun god? What you going to do now? I'm bringing darkness all the way down so that you can feel it. Where's your God now? But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take care to never see my face again. For on the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. And that is the end of the section that we are going to cover. The idea is here, Pharaoh is done with Moses. Um, Pharaoh is nearly spent. Um, Moses is, is still being called back and forth. He's being treated almost like a slave before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh finally says, I am done with you. Get out. The next time you see me, I will have you killed. So you can get the idea like this competition <laughs> This uh, engagement is, in some ways, it's being ramped up, but it's also coming to a, a close. The pressure is mounting on Pharaoh. We're going to pause here. I'm going to come back with a couple questions for us to think about, and then we will finish up. A right, um, couple questions to think about for Sunday. There's a lot here to discuss. Come with your own, own, own questions, but here's a couple things um, to think about. Um, first off, um, Pharaoh is being told and taught um, you think you are here, but when actually you are way down here, you are not God. And so one of my big questions for us to consider this week is how has God revealed to you that you are not God? We live in a society which reinforces our immense power and our, our, our resources. I can order something on Amazon and sometimes by the next morning, by 8 a.m., it is in my box on my front doorstep. Um, it is easy to be confused about what my rights are and what say I have in the runnings of the universe. Um, so question for you, um, are you that distant from Pharaoh? Where do you see yourself wrestling with the idea that you at times act or feel like God and being reminded by God that you aren't God? So that's one, one question. Second, um, do you see how Moses speaks as a prophet? And part of the idea here is this. God's word is always a check on our independence. And you see that this come out in the prophets with even some of the greatest kings in Israel's history. God often would send prophets to say, hey, you're headed in this, this direction, but I'm telling you to go this direction. And there's this idea that all power on earth is to be checked by God's word. Um, and so that's pretty personal for us. How has God recently checked your power? If God loves us and he cares about us, he will put our power in check. He will speak to us and tell us no. Where has God told you no recently? Thirdly, um, Yahweh is known not simply by what he says, but by what he does. And this kind of carry over from, from last week. If we are to be a judge of Yahweh by the things he does, both here and later in the scriptures, how does that define who he is? And the idea that is being communicated is someone is defined not just by what they say, um, but by what they do. How is Yahweh defined by what he, what, what he does? Fourth thing, and this is just an interesting point, God loves to make a distinction between his people and everybody else. Um, what are healthy ways that that distinction should come out now? And what are some ways that at times we misunderstand that idea that God's people are distinct from everyone else? And lastly, um, I just, I think we need to discuss a little bit the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. 
And this kind of returns us maybe to, um, to the first question of, does God have the right and the say and even the impetus at times to have a say over our lives, even in hardening our heart? Because a lot of us have a struggle with free will. Am I an, in, an independent being who, who has a say over my life? Or am I an automaton? I think we're all pretty clear we're not automatons. I think we're all also pretty clear. There are things that influence us that are far beyond free, as it were, will. So great, great discussion point for Sunday. Why is it hard for us to hear that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Um, point of discussion. Anyway, I hope, I hope we can have a great discussion Sunday. I look forward to it. I know this section's long because the passage is super long, but uh, I'll see you Sunday. Let's have a good time. Thanks. Bye.